Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. We now come on to one of the core, most interesting uh, topics in economics, which is when we're going to look at the theory of the firm. Now, what is the theory of the firm about? Well, um, the, the aim, the reason that people go into business and they open their own firms and they produce their own products, whether goods or services, we would assume is for one reason only. They don't just want to make a living out of it. Think about all the risks that they take in bankruptcy. They want to make a profit. And not any profit. They want to make a, an abnormal profit. An abnormal profit, let's put the word on the board, an, ab an abnormal profit is when, after the pay, all their expenses, including their own wages, they're paid for their land, they're paid for their labour, they're paid for their capital, they still have money over and as much as possible, which they can, be, which they can use for what they like. They're no longer living from hand to mouth. Right? They're not worried about their next month's wages. They haven't got profits, and they can do what they like with their profits. They can reinvest them in the business. They can buy themselves a Rolls Royce or anything else in between. Or just simply save it. Profits. Now, when we talk about a normal profit, which is, um, let's face it, is the what you need to survive in business, you need to make quite sure that the amount of the uh, the amount of money that you're actually getting is enough to be able to cover the amount that you pay for your land, for your buildings, your rents, your labour, that is anybody that you're going to be employing, including yourself, because you have to pay yourself a wage as well, and also your capital. Now that can be your machinery, it can be, um, it can be um, the raw materials that you actually use to produce your products, and so on. Now, for the benefit of this lesson, I'm going to pick falafel. You all know what falafel is, right? It's one of these things that you have a piece of bread, right? Then you, you fry the falafel balls, right? And then you put lots and lots of salad and other things and condiments and sauces and all the rest of it. And for a reasonable price, you've actually got a portable feast. Okay, so we're going to be using falafels. Put that in bread. This is not an economic concept. Let us first of all define our concept. What is the what is the abnormal profit that every person in business wants to make? That abnormal that abnormal that abnormal profit is when your total revenue now revenue is the money that you get in. When that total revenue standing for TR is greater than your total cost. And of course, for some people, that's not good enough. Because once your total cost, which is, which is, which is you, which includes the wage that you pay yourself, once your total revenue, you're getting more money over that counter, right, and then you're actually having to pay for your land, labour and capital, that means you have made an abnormal profit. For some people, though, making an abnormal profit isn't enough. We have to go one stage further. We have to maximise our profit. Profits, right? If it's possible to get a bit more, right? We're going to think how we're going to be able to do that. Profit maximization typically is the aim of every firm. Now, for this class, for this presentation, we're going to assume that everybody who goes into business wants to profit maximize. In future episodes, we're going to question that because there are other reasons why people go into business other than um, trying to, to maximise their profits. We will consider this in a later episode. So, um, what happens? Well, of course, people would like to maximise their profits, but the reality is, and they'd certainly like to make abnormal profits, but some people, and especially those who run small businesses, are often struggling to be able to keep their nose above the water, to be able to keep the wolf away from the door. Right? They don't want it, and the minimum that they need to 
be able to keep the wolf in the long run right, away from the door is that they should be making a normal profit. Right? Which is where total costs equals total revenue. That means so total revenue minus A equals total costs, which means that the amount of money that comes in is enough to pay land labour and land capital, including the wages for the owner, uh, including, uh, and uh, there's nothing left over. In other words, this is only living on a salary. Well, the much worse things than living on a salary is not you can pay your bills, you're doing okay. The trouble is, what happens when total revenue is less than total cost? That means that the business is in trouble. How much trouble the business is actually in is something that we're going to look at very, very soon. Uh, that, the situation in the red, which is where the business is going, looks as if it might be going under a bit, where the amount of, the, the, the amount of money that's coming in is not enough to cover the costs. That is the situation that um, people in business dread. But unfortunately, when you see the closure of small businesses today, it is one that is all too common. Now, all this sounds as if we're being very mean, as if the only reason that people go into business is to help themselves, right, and they want no care for the public. And I suppose one could even argue that that might be part of the story at this stage, but there is another side of the story. Because, and this is something that I want to keep in mind, in theory, people go into business to maximise their profits. Now, that doesn't sound good news for the consumer. Right, there's just people who want more and more money out of them. But as we shall see during the, um, as we shall see, as we study this topic, that in fact it can sometimes work out to the advantage of the consumer, the person who's buying the products, and not work out to the advantage of the, of the producer in the long run. Sometimes it can work out to the advantage of both. But one of the ideas of Adam Smith, which I mentioned in a previous class, is that um, in free market economics, um, but by everybody acting in their own interests, it actually in the long run can work out in everybody's favour, in both the producer's favour and in the consumer's favour. Let's take this off the board now. And we're going to be looking at three aspects. We're first going to look at costs and revenues, which every business has to have. And then we're going to be having a look at one model of business called perfect competition in the short run and perfect competition in the long run. Let us now look at costs and revenues. Costs is how much you actually spend. Revenue in her to keep the business going, your land, your labour, your capital, your factor of production. Revenues is the amount that's coming in. Now let's look at it first. Let's look at the revenues and that's the easy bit. What you've got to know is what is the relationship between the industry and the firm. Now, the industry, uh, let's pretend that it's falafels. Uh, the industry works like this. You've got your demand here, and you've got your supply there. That's falafels in town. P1, Q1. And let's say that the value of the falafel is four dollars. Right? One price quantity, four dollars, and you can actually take a falafel home with you. That you can buy one. That is the equilibrium price. That is what the industry sets for falafels in a city. Now let's have a look at Joe. Joe produces falafels. So um, this is the industry, but Joe is not the industry. You know why? Because there are plenty of other Joes in the city that are also producing falafels at the falafel stand. So we're going to have to do a separate, uh, a separate thing, a separate idea. If the industry sets the price at P, what, P, at, uh, P1, which is $4, that means that every single Joe in the city will be receiving only $4 for his falafel. If Joe decides to put his price above all the other Joes in the city, no one's going to come and do business with him. What happens if he puts his price down? He's not, well, why should he? If he does, everybody else will put their price down, so no one's going to end up making profits. Or is that true? We will look at later. We'll look at this later. So this is the industry, and let's now do the diagram for the firm. If the firm industry 
sets the price, the firm takes the price. So let's put a nice diagram of the firm. Now, this is Joe's. Joe's the lapel. Now, uh, we don't talk about quantity when we're dealing with a firm, right? Joe's talking about his output. Does he produce 10 falafels a day, 100 falafels a day, 1,000 falafels a day? See what I mean? That's his output. He's also got two things on this axis, but that's like quantity. Whereas with a firm, we talk about quantity. So with the industry, we talk about the total quantity produced by all the Joe's in town who produce falafel. And when we're talking about the firm, we talk about um, the amount that Joe's producing, Joe's output, which is only a very small percentage of the total number of falafels produced in town. Here we've got CP. CP is costs and price. Right? We're going to put them the same. Because we're going to put the cost curves, which I'm going to be using in red, and we're, uh, which I'm going to be using in red, and we're going to be putting the revenue curves, which I'm going to use for green. Let's do the revenue curves first, it's easier. Now, how much, right, if the going rate for a falafel is four dollars, that will mean that how much will Joe, how much will Joe receive? Four dollars for every falafel. So we're going to put P1 here. And now, if Joe sells one falafel only, he's going to receive four dollars. If he uh, sells loads and loads of falafels, he's going to get four dollars for every one. So therefore, right, for each one that he sells, right, he gets an extra four dollars. So if he sold, um, if he sold a thousand, he get four thousand dollars. If he sold a thousand and one, he get four thousand and four dollars. So how much did he get on the last one, on number thousand and one? Four dollars. If he sold ten thousand and two, he get another one. But the point is that for each extra one that he sells, he gets the same price. And when we talk about each extra one that he sells, that is the MR, and MR stands for marginal MR stands for the marginal revenue. Marginal revenue is anything that's marginal, how much did you money did you get on the very last one that you produced? That's marginal. Okay? That is the revenue curve for Joe's falafel. As we shall see, any other type of business which is in perfect competition, meaning that wherever you go in town, wherever you try to buy the thing, you're getting roughly the same thing. Uh, for example, fruit markets. Whether you buy from one store in the market or another store in the market, oranges will cost you the same price. So the orange people are in perfect competition with each other. Okay, another example could be taxi rides. Right, everybody, everybody charges you roughly the same amount for a taxi ride. So each taxi is in perfect competition, uh, company is in perfect competition with the others. Those are because you're getting roughly the same thing from, um, from the same lot of people. So the whole taxi industry is perfect competition, right? And the, um, the taxi industry is perfect competition, the falafel industry is in perfect competition. So for, every, for everything that they actually produce, right, they charge the same amount, and that is the curve, the marginal revenue. Now let's go to the harder thing. And the harder bit, it's a little bit harder, it's more exciting, is the costs. Now, the costs work as follows. The, that um, you need three things that you've got to pay for. You've got to pay for your land, you've got to pay for your labour, and you've got to pay for your, um, for your camp. But there's another way that we can divide the costs, which is as follows, right? We can have fixed costs, and we can have variable costs. Now, let's go back to Joe's falafel. Joe's opening a falafel shop. His fixed costs, which means he only has to pay every now and again, your fixed costs, only, whereas your variable costs mean that for every falafel you produce, your variable costs go up. Your fixed costs might be the rent. He may have to pay rent once a year, say on the 1st of January. And that covers the rent. But once he's paid his rent, 
He doesn't have to pay a penny more rent for another year. His fixed costs are gone. If he's got a taxi, he's got to pay for his taxi. If he's got his vehicle, he's got to pay for his license and uh, for necessary health and safety business. For that, you don't pay every day. You only pay every now and again and again. Those are fixed costs. Now, let me explain. With fixed costs, the curve goes like this. Right? You've got costs and you've got outputs. But if you're only producing a few, right, the fixed costs are enormous. As it are enormous. If you're only producing 100 for apples a year, right, those, the, those fixed costs, your rent and all the rest, are shared by the cost of 100 for apples a year. Um, the, the revenue won't get you very far. But if you're producing 10,000 or 100,000, or perhaps going towards a million for apples a year, then those fixed costs are being divided by a much larger number. So therefore, your fixed costs are shaped like this. Right? As the number produces and your output produces, your fixed costs per level go down. Now, we've all got a set of number costs. That's your variable costs. Your variable costs are like this. For your falafel, your variable costs would be your vegetables, your oil, your electricity, you know, the amount that you pay for the sauces and for the onion, for the fried onions and all the other sorts of things, all those extras. Right, they are variable costs, because the more falafels you produce, the more you actually make, I and mean, the, 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 the higher the costs. Likewise with the taxi. Your taxi might be the petrol, the gasoline, um, the gasoline, um, and um, the more you use the taxi, the more the variable costs are. So, for the um, variable costs, as you go to the curve, if this is the fixed cost curve, Right? The variable cost curve with output is going to be in the other direction, which is actually VC right? per falafel. As in, no, sorry, in total, the total variable costs. Right? Um, because um, what's happening is that your variable, if you're not producing any falafel, you've got no variable costs at all. If your taxi is stuck in the garage, you've got no variable costs. But the further you go, the greater the variable costs. I'm bending it slightly, you know why, in that direction, because variable costs tend to uh, not increase at the same rate, increase at a lower rate. When you're dealing with big stuff, a very good reason for larger customers, because you've got wholesale discounts and things like that. Now, the, the, you've got fixed costs and variable costs. However, your total costs are a combination of fixed costs and variable costs. We'll call fixed costs FC, we'll call variable costs VC. So therefore, total costs equals FC plus VC. Now, that's not so much of interest. What is of interest is how much does it cost us on average to produce a falafel? And that would be the average total costs and the is average fixed costs and average variable costs. For example, for falafel number 10,000, right, it, you, it, it would have cost 50 cents for you to cover the fixed costs, because that's divided by 10,000, plus uh, $150 to be able to cover the variable costs, your land labour and your capital. So you produce it for $2. That was your average, to, your average total cost per, per falafel. But you're getting $4 for each one, so you get $2 profit. And that means that you're able to maximise your profits. So what we're, going to, what we're going to do is as follows. We're going to combine the fixed costs and the variable costs. And then we get this type of curve. By combining them together, right, it appears that it's a bit like this. That is ATC, which is the, which is the average total cost. You see what happens at the beginning, they're very high because the fixed costs are to take a very big proportion. But what happens is they go down, because, but then they start going up again for the following reason. And that's the reason I'm going to tell you now. When your business gets too big, you're going to have to hire extra premises. That costs more than falafels. You're going to have to hire extra people. Now, if you've got one person working for you, or maybe two people working for you, they are going to work hard because they know their wages depend on it. But as when you've got three or four people working for you, typically, start chatting to each other, ooh, 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 time gets wasted. They'll still produce falafels, 
but you've got to pay them all the same wage, and you're not getting the same value per worker. So that's why this goes up. Now, let's look at this purple curve, which is the ATC curve. And what this gets us to, to understand this curve, is the law of diminishing returns. Let's write this down. The law of diminishing The law of diminishing returns that is as follows. Uh, that when, you said, um, when you've, got, you've got three factors of production, land, labour and capital. Let us assume that the land and the capital are the same. But it costs you more, but, but, so therefore those are two fixed factors. Right? You've got the same frying pans, you've got the same gas, you've got the same cookers, right? um, and you've got the same buildings that you're paying for. Right? Those are constants. You've got to pay for that as part of your fixed costs. Your variables are your wages and perhaps some of the raw materials. They go up. Now, for the same facilities that you've got, right, so for the same factors that you've got that are fixed, right, you're going to put more and more strain on them. You're going to put more and more strain on your land and on your facilities. So what happens is as follows, is you employ more people and so on. Let us hold the land and the capital, for this example, as constants. That means that whether you produce one or whether you produce a million, it's exactly the same. It's the same cost. But what we start doing is that we start increasing right, steadily the number that we're producing. That means we have to employ more people. Now, at the beginning, it works out cheaper. We have one two people producing, it works out cheaper for the lab. But perhaps when we get about three or four maybe, people producing, well, they didn't produce so much. So although we're still making a profit, right, we're, we're selling more and more, but not for the same price, because we're getting diminishing returns. As we add workers, we get fewer, um, we get a lower output per worker. And that's the law of diminishing returns. As you apply, um, more, should we say, strain on a factor, more um, elements onto a factor of production, what happens is that you will be getting, uh, for the marginal ones, less and less and less. Right? The floor of diminishing returns says that as we hold one factor of production constant, and we continue to add other factors of production, right, we will get less and less return as we continue to add factors of production. And that's what's happened here, and that accounts for the rise of that curve. Now, that has explained to us the cost and revenue, and it's taken us a good way into the second topic, which is perfect competition, which is the long run. At this point, um, we're going to close the eye, um, we're going to carry on with perfect competition, in the next episode, and um, we're going to keep this one to costs and um, to costs and revenues. Um, and in the next episodes, we will be applying them to the four different types of firms, which is perfect competition, which uh, perfect competition, um, monopolistic competition, monopolies, and. Um, and oligopolies. In all these business structures, which we're going to explore one by one, um, they've got the common thing. People want to make an abnormal profit, that's the producers. Consumers want to get what they can as cheaply as possible. Um, and we will find that depending on the business structure, depends on the position of the producer and the consumer who is stronger and who is weaker, who gets the better deal, who gets the, work, the, the, the poorer deal. But here's the spoiler for you, it's not as obvious as you think. So ladies and gentlemen, from here we will move on to the next episode.